Thanks for having me here. Um, I'll let you turn a lot of your math brain off. I'm going to try to be a little faster and higher level, but m hopefully interesting to all of you. Um, I am going to talk about a paper by Simon Parsons and, uh, and a group of people from uh, a university in Brooklyn. Simon is now a professor at King's College London, a computer scientist. Um, so I love. I love this paper. Uh, I discovered it in uh, 2012 by accident. And uh, the reason I discovered it is because uh, I was, we actually started working with uh, nonprofit auctions and we're trying to either buy, build, or figure out a system to do bidding. And uh, that those auctions were uh, silent auctions, people would come with a piece of paper, they'd write their name and the price, and another person would come and write the name and the price, and then at the end of the day, somebody would collect the papers, and the last name with the highest price would win uh, the item. These are very big numbers, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And uh, in wanting to implement that in software, I, I, I tried to find anything on auctions out there, and I found some working systems, and I found some people who knew, seemed to know a lot about auctions, but none of these things gave me enough of an introduction. And uh, everybody had a completely different opinion about what to do, uh, what, what I should be doing with, uh, with this auction software. So uh, the, this paper made a lot of things so clear and uh, gave me a wonderful introduction into auctions and just enough computer science to understand what I'm dealing with. And uh, from there, we built an implementation. I'll talk a little bit about that, and then other implementations following that. So uh, this was from the first auction we did for uh, a wonderful nonprofit organization called ICI, Independent Curators International, that literally gives money to artists, to, uh, to curators, uh, to work uh, on, on, on their projects. And this was a huge success. So um, what's an auction? Uh, this is what you probably know from auctions. This is from last week. Uh, it's a Basquiat painting that sold to a Japanese collector for, you know, uh, 90, I think, million dollars, 110 million dollars with fees, uh, which the buyer gladly paid. Um, this is 110 million dollars, which made Basquiat the most expensive uh, art United States-born artist uh, in history, surpassing Warhol. Uh, that was a very exciting auction, and as you can imagine, um, the way that runs is that there is an auctioneer standing on a podium, and uh, the auctioneer says, we'll start at $60 million, and uh, somebody uh, touches their nose somewhere in the, in the audience, maybe raises a paddle, and it goes $70 million, and $80 million, $82 million, and it goes on and on and on, and eventually there is a top bid, and um, it's sold at... 90 something million dollars. Um, so all this is is a whole production. It's more like a, it's more like cinema than uh, than actually anything uh, like a transaction. And uh, there's quite a bit of history uh, to this. Uh, uh, the, the whole ritual of an auction is, is quite fascinating. Uh, there was a story of uh, Louis Saez Sofer, Louis XVI Sofer, that was sold in 18th uh, century France at an auction house called Parque Bennett that no longer exists. And um, the auctioneer had an agreement with the bidder uh, where the bidder would, did not want to signal anything to other bidders in the room. And so when the bidder had their coat unbuttoned, the auctioneer would consider that they are willing to take the next bid. And so they go back and forth to the person with their coat unbuttoned. Well, that buyer uh, needed to run urgently out of the room for some reason, and he ran out with an unbuttoned coat. And the auction continued, and when the buyer returned, he won the lot, the sofa, for an exorbitant amount of money, uh, because the auctioneer said, you know, while the coat is unbuttoned, I'm just taking bids from you, up to whatever price. And so there was a big debate whether it was okay for the, uh, for the code to be 
uh, whether the code was still considered unbuttoned while outside of the uh, bidding room. Um, so there's a lot of stories like that, and uh, mostly everybody is um, is sitting there like scared to make a move because they're afraid that the auctioneer will see them, and now you're on the hook for some some large amount of money. Uh, but today, of course, the auctions are auctions are everywhere. Uh, we, we are all uh, familiar with uh, with eBay and with the advent of the internet. Everybody takes a part of auctions in a variety of formats, online and uh, and offline. And so, um, even for those that don't bid on anything on eBay, you might have heard for this group about auctions of uh, of uh, of wave spectrums, for example, radio frequency spectrums uh, for mobile phone operators. Those are actually bid as well in auctions. There's quite a bit of auctions in finance. So uh, the paper surveys uh, these auctions and introduces them uh, and tries to build a classification of these auctions and then tries to draw some conclusions out of them. So there is the way we think about auctions is that there is a real menagerie of them. So there is all kinds of auctions and they are single dimensional, multi-dimensional, single sided, double sided, first price, which is the highest bid wins, or second price, nth price, English, Dutch, Japanese. Um, there is open cry auctions and silent auctions. There's auctions on the, Jap on the Tokyo fish market and so on and so forth. So there's all this plethora of names. And these names are not quite consistent through literature, but there's some now agreement around what these things are called. So one way to uh, to, to look at auction, and this is what we're going to do here, uh, we're going to talk about auction families. We're going to look at how uh, auctions are analyzed, uh, give a little bit of uh, a, a process view of auctions, talk this much about computer science, just a little introduction to get you curious if you want to go and dig into the paper, and then I can talk a little bit about the implementation of an auction and give you some links uh, to those things. All right, so let's talk about uh, auction uh, families to start. Um, so auctions were invented, uh, so uh, first consider an auction. An auction is really an exchange of money for goods, most of the time. And so uh, auctions have existed as a mode of selling ever since uh, the, uh, since money was invented, which is you know maybe 700 BC. Uh, and auctions are known uh, to have existed in Rome and Greece in around fifth century BC uh, where uh, goods were exchanged for money in kind of a bidding format, and you know those are. So if you look at when were auctions invented, auctions were really invented in in those dark Middle Ages, uh, where people used to have their heads chopped off for all kinds of of reasons. Uh, so if you look at the features of auctions, uh, it's easier to think about them as a, as a hierarchy, uh, and so these these features are uh, now broadly recognized in literature. And while the names are uh, not universal, it's the type into which auctions can be divided rather than the terminology uh, that is most important. So we look at this as a tree of single, of dimensionality of auctions, then how many sides auction have, what kind of information is available through auctions, uh, who wins, and then what is being bid on and how the mechanics of that works. So let's start with single dimensional versus uh, multi dimensional auctions. So a single dimensional auction uh, means that there is only one aspect that matters, and that is the price offered for a good. The multi dimensional auction, you have other aspects that are important, such as, for example, uh, the quality of the good that is being delivered, or maybe the date at which the item is delivered. So they're not as simple as just the price for, for an item. If I am auctioning you know, fish, it kind of matters how fast the fish can be delivered to me. So there's many more aspects, and this is that simple. It's price only versus uh, other, uh, other aspects. Um, in a one-sided auctions, uh, you have bidders who are either buyers or sellers. Typically, the way you think of an auction, you have only a buyer. The auctioneer's job is to decide you know, who, uh, who wins in an auction. Uh, in a two-sided auction, you have both buyers and sellers submitting bids, and then the auctioneer decides how to resolve, uh, how to match buyers to sellers. Okay, makes sense? Um, if we continue, there is um, open cry auctions where 
uh, every bidder hears every other bid, which is uh, kind of important. So you can, uh, you can see, you can hear or see what is going on, where we are with bids. And then uh, in a silent, in a sealed bid auction, or silent auction, only the, uh, in a sealed bid auction, it's not, uh, sorry, not a silent auction, only the auctioneer knows uh, what is being bid and what's, uh, what's happening. So um, these are pretty, pretty simple decisions. Uh, distinctions. The first price versus end price auction uh, is what it is. So if you look at the first price auction, well, the winning bidder pays the price that they have uh, that that they have uh, bid. And then in an nth price auction, the uh, bidder, the winner, pays the nth price. Uh, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of important. Um, in a um, in in a, one of the early software competitions. Uh, the uh, auction was run with the 16th price. So the winner actually paid the 16th price of the lots that was being bid on. And why would you do that? Well, that encourages risk because I can bid really high because I know that I will only pay a price that's the 16th price in the auction. And a lot of software-based systems settle in uh, auctions that take nth price pretty far in number, so to encourage the risk taking of the, of the system. So a lot of automatic trading tends to do that. Um, in a single unit auction, you are bidding uh, for a single good. In a multi-unit auction, it's what it is, you are bidding on a multitude of goods. So uh, that's interesting. Like if, if you use my fish example, uh, I might want for my uh, restaurant to have you know, two cases of cod and five cases of salmon. Uh, however, I don't want any of those things separately because I really cannot have a menu at the end of the day. So the value of these items combined is actually not at all the value of each individual item plus the value of the other individual item. Uh, and that, that's really important for an auction. So that complicates things uh, quite a bit. Um, in, there are also auctions uh, that are uh, combinatorial in the sense that uh, you have goods that are not the same thing. I might want fish of a certain quality, then a delivery date, then some other uh, aspect of this. And then uh, if, you, if you can imagine maybe um, in, in, some, in some ways like I might be okay with like arbitrary combinations of these things, but in other ways I might not. So those are combinatorial auctions. All right, so the simplest auction terminology when once you aggregate all the stuff is called an English auction. So an English auction is the most common of auctions that you see uh, typically in an art, uh, art setting. So um, it's the most familiar one as well. So the, the way it works is that uh, you know, a bidder, an auctioneer calls a price and then the bidder set, raises their hand and says, I want to take that item. So that's the standard auction house auction, and it's uh, single dimensional, as there's only one aspect, which is the uh, price that you, are, uh, that you are paying. And then uh, it's one-sided, it's sell-side, because uh, except the seller might set something called the reserve price, which is the minimum amount at which the uh, good will be sold, but really there's only one person deciding what's going on, and it's the auctioneer calling the numbers and the seller makes that uh, decision. Uh, it's a single good because we are bidding at one thing at a time. It's open cry because once uh, a bid has been announced, then everybody knows uh, about, about this bid. And the only particularity of, a, of an English auction is that the bids are done in ascending order. Uh, so the auctioneer is actually the one who says what the next bid is. It's often um, common for people to think that actually the bidder is deciding the price, but it's not true. The auctioneer takes the previous price and takes an increment up on top of that and then calls that number. And the bidder, all the bidder does is to accept that number or not accept that number. And uh, the auction ends when, uh, of course, nobody accepts a high bid. So uh, and the, the price that is, uh, that is paid is that price. Uh, so um, ironically, an auction, which is where we, we write numbers and, uh, uh, and everybody can see the paper, is called an open cry auction. Um, we, but it's silent, so it's a, it's a little bit confusing. Uh, the next most familiar uh, type of auction is the Dutch auction. So it's a single dimensional, one-sided, 
open cry, single good auction, except that the bids are happening in descending order. And um, the first bidder to accept the price, the first one to raise their hand, is the one who wins the lot. And that's why sometimes these auctions used to be called descending clock. The way they were implemented without computers is that there was an actual clock and the auctioneer would do this with the clock and just the price would go down until somebody's like, I want this at that price. And uh, the lot would, would go to them. Uh, so Dutch auctions are very common in Canada for perishable uh, goods. Uh, flowers in Netherlands are typically sold with, uh, with this kind of auction. Uh, fish in Israel and Spain is sold uh, the same way. And uh, tobacco is sold in Canada uh, in the Dutch auction. Uh, if you take the, if you split these two and mix them up a little bit, you get the Japanese auction. Uh, so in the Japanese auction, the auctioneer calls out um, ascending prices, and bidders are indicating that they're dropping out of the auction instead of actually coming in. So uh, this makes the auction single-dimensional, one-sided, open cry, first price. And the first electronic options like that were implemented in a, in a kind of almost mechanical way. People would hold a button, and as the price is being yelled, they eventually release the button to say that they drop out. And the, pers the last person holding the button is the one who gets the, uh, uh, who, who gets the lot. Um, so uh, in, um, in, in some auctions, one of the... Um, one of the problems is that all this uh, information is open, and so a variation of these open auction is uh, something called the Vickery auction. It's a second price silent auction. What's, what's great about the Vickery auction is that uh, you can safely bid the actual max uh, that you think the good is worth because you'll be paying the second price. So uh, it's a silent auction. I just write a bid on the paper and I give it to the auctioneer. The auctioneer reveals everything, looks at everything, finds the highest bidder, and then you pay the second price. So in theory, this helps me not overbid for, uh, for the lot. So um, unfortunately, this has some interesting consequences. Um, and, uh, and this is where auction theory starts coming in. Uh, this actually has trouble maximizing seller revenue. In New Zealand, there was an auction for, uh, for radio spectrum. And uh, there were only two bids, one for 100 million and one for one dollar. So uh, the bidder who bid 100 million got the entire radio frequency spectrum for one dollar. Uh, so there is a little bit of unintended uh, consequence. But eBay has the same. eBay eBay has the same. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, if you, depending on how many people bid, uh, you can. You, you can look at this as like win or lose, right? So in one hand you bid more, but on the other hand you might lose. Um, so finally there are some buy side auctions, which is not quite intuitive. Think about the credit uh, or, the, or the mortgage market in the United States. You get bombarded by offers to, to take a loan, right? You don't even need the money, but you get this envelope <laughs> that says to you for only 2%, 2.5%, 10%, whatever, uh, you can get $10,000 and live richly for a long time until you have to pay it back. Well, uh, credit rankings, uh, this kind of uh, mortgage offers, other credit cards, these are all examples of, of a, of a buy-side auction. So basically, sellers offer various terms, uh, and then you just sit there and decide which term you want once you want. Uh, this thing. It's also a form of auction because every, all these sellers are bidding uh, for, for, for your business. Uh, procurement is often done in that way in large organizations. Um, so if you look at, the, uh, at auctions which have, uh, which have multiple sides, you have a good example with something called a coal market or a double auction. Uh, it's an auction in which there are asks and there are bids, and we reconcile them together at a certain time, we clear them. So that acts as a clearing house. So if you look at like demand supply in various times, and you run this on a period, and you constantly clear this, uh, that becomes something that we call a double auction. And actually both sides of this, the bid and the ask, are called, uh, have a generic name, and it's called an offer. 
Um, and there is a there is a classic way to solve the like what price should we should we be paying? There's a formula for that. I'll skip that. Uh, if you can if you do a continuous double auction, well that's your uh, typical stock market. Uh, so a seller looks to sell blocks of shares, right, a bunch of stuff at particular price, and you have a buyer that looks to buy a different block of shares at a different price. And we look at these offers and uh, at, at these asks and these uh, and these bids, and we have to reconcile them periodically to actually sell. Uh, a number of shares. So these are typically multi-unit auctions. And uh, this is exactly how the New York Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange uh, operates, uh, operates today. It's parallel continuous auctions and the, those require actual specialists on the floor to organize this whole thing because they have to make decisions based on uh, what, is be, what is being traded. Um, another way of um, looking at, at which prices the, uh, the, the auction starts and uh, the prices, the open prices are determined by a series of call markets, which is, which is complicated and a different story. Um, so other types of auctions are these multi-dimensional, multi-attribute auctions, like anything goes. Think of, uh, think of uh, travel with air flights, where you, have, you want to bid on the cheapest flight, uh, but you also need to kind of get somewhere. And then you have all these combinations of things. And so it gets, uh, it gets pretty hard and pretty difficult to, uh, to construct something that works in those, uh, in those cases. So uh, in addition, you have auctions that are single auctions involving multiple uh, companies. So you might have an airline, and then you have a bus company, and then you have a hotel company, and all of this has to come together, and they have to resolve and, 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 uh, and do the, uh, the settling at the end of the day. All right, so this, is a, this was a brief overview of, uh, of auction types. So hopefully, if, if you retain one thing out of it, is that you can think of these auctions as a hierarchy. And uh, there's multiple aspects to, uh, to all these auctions. So um, once, you have, once you understand all these uh, features of auctions, the, the hardest thing to do for an auctioneer or somebody who's trying to sell anything uh, is to decide what kind of auction to run. And this is, uh, and this paper really calls attention to how do we, uh, how do we decide which auction to run. So there can be two um, two ways of cons of considering an auction. Uh, the first one is called efficiency of an auction, and it's um, the idea is that we can achieve the allocation of money and goods that maximizes the total value for everybody. You know, so everybody is happy, and that's a that's a typical auction. Uh, there are, though, some auctions that are concerned with optimality, such as maximizing the revenue for the seller. Uh, so maybe you're trying to sell something for the most amount of money. Uh, and why would you do that? Well, if you're an auction house, then you're trying to maximize your revenue. And so you're running the auction, you might as well get the most money. So you don't care if it's fair or not fair to all the participants. What you care about is your fees. Uh, and so optimality is maximizing the revenue, usually of the bid of the bid taker. Um, and so, for uh, to understand how to select an auction, uh, the, uh, the there were another a number of auction models, and you, because this is a complex system with many moving parts, a number of models were developed. And so there are three uh, that I talked about in the paper. The first one is called the independent private values model. The second one is correlated values model, and the third is almost common. Um, Va values uh, model. And the outcome obviously depends on the way participants bid. And so you need models to, uh, to decide. So an independent private values model is that you have, uh, it, it, the, every model has some assumptions, and then every model draws some conclusions. So I'll give some examples. Independent private values model assumes that you have many bidders that are bidding for some object, and the object doesn't matter, uh, but that uh, each buyer is risk neutral. What does that mean? It means that the buyer will bid the amount that they th up to the amount that they think is the object is worth. That's really important. If I am risk averse, I will never bid up to the maximum that I am hoping that I think the the object is worth. If I'm a risk taker, I will bid above the price that the object is worth. So in this model, we assume that each buyer is risk neutral. They will bid up to the amount, um, and then. Uh, the value of this uh, of of the object is private to the buyer. So 
I made my own conclusion as a buyer of what that object is worth to me. So it's not like I'm bidding on a box of gold that has a specific price, publicly known and all that. It's what I think that's worth. And of course, it has to be private. We don't know from each other what that is, uh, what, what these things are worth. So I don't know what you think the value is worth. And so if you look at, the, uh, at these assumptions, you'll find that uh, Dutch and first price uh, sealed bid auctions I actually produce the same outcomes because the bidder only has one choice they, in both of these auctions. They just decide that, what they, that they're going to bid up to and they pick a price to bid and they go up to the price that they expect to. And then uh, English and second price sealed bid auctions are equivalent as well because you bid up to the value um, uh, to, the, to the bidder. So it's interesting to see that these, the way you run them differently, there are some equivalent uh, options uh, of, of what auctions to select. And the paper goes in detail about proving that this is the case uh, for those two, although this seems pretty logical. Uh, more interestingly, this model makes it uh, Pareto optimal. That means if I, um, if I it's, it's a concept in economics, if I give somebody a certain a certain value, then I cannot give them more value by taking it away from somebody else. So it means that everybody has some redistribution that you cannot upset, you cannot cr arbitrarily create more value to one by other than by taking it from somebody else. Um, and uh, you get almost identical uh, revenue um, from, uh, from, all these, uh, from all these auctions to the seller. So it doesn't matter how you proceed with these auctions, you're gonna get identical revenue on average for, for the seller. Now, very interestingly, uh, all of this, um, because everyone, everyone does not, while everyone has common value for something, there's always, the winner always thought that the good was worth more money. And so they typically, uh, the winner typically overpays in these auctions. It's called the winner's curse. You pay just a little bit more than the price that the good is actually worth if you, everything was open in the open and well known. Uh, so winner's curse is, uh, is, is pretty typical. Now, if you, um, th this also leads um, to something called the RAT. It's a revenue equivalence. Uh, theorem and it says that assume that all these inputs are the same, all major types of auction generate the same expected revenue and uh, this is like the first theorem that is called out in the paper. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to the paper for you to read and understand uh, all the details of this. All right, the correlated values model is just a generalization of that. Uh, so we have the, uh, it's a generalization of the uh, independent uh, private values model. And uh, it fits the, uh, the, real, uh, the real world a little bit better. That is that um, the, everyone estimates a particular object in a particular way. Uh, but uh, if I hear somebody else bid on an item, that potentially raises the estimate of the lot. So while I'm bidding, I'm thinking, huh, they're bidding, uh, they're bidding more on the lot or they're bidding with me, that means that at least it's worth that much. So that as the auction runs, uh, it uh, reinforces the value and increases the value uh, of the item. And so uh, it, this only works if the, uh, if the prices are positively correlated, which means they can only go, go up. Uh, so it also assumes that not all buyers have an accurate value of the goods sold, that means that uh, we, we, have, we don't actually know what it's, uh, what it's worth or we don't have the common understanding. And so the, in the conclusions of this model are quite interesting is that an English auction will lead to higher prices than a second bid sealed auction and that uh, more interestingly revealing information about the lot. So let's say I'm bidding on uh, the right to, to, to mine a particular mountain or something like that, then revealing more information, even if the information is negative, will actually, uh, will actually increase prices overall. Uh, and that, that's an interesting thing, but th this, this conclusion is fascinating for the art market because art market is traditionally very, very, um, very private, is that the more information you publish about what is being sold, the more people will be willing uh, to bid and that the prices will actually rise because people know uh, more about what they're, what they're buying. What is 
uh, it's what, what's what's co positively correlated is uh, is the prices. So the the amount of money I'm willing to pay for something. Individuals. That's right. Different individuals raise each other in this. Uh, the more the more we know about each other's opinion, the more the price will rise. So, all right. And then finally, there's the almost almost common um, values model, and so. Um, the, um, it, it's, it, this is a model that has some, some interesting precedent. Uh, there was a case in the LA license of a, a spectrum auction, a radio spectrum auction, and um, all the bidders um, assumed that they had a similar value, that the, the spectrum had the same value to all the bidders, but however, it was not uh, true. The, uh, the, the, there was a company called Pactel that had a small advantage. It had a database of existing customers in the license area. And, uh, and executives who were familiar with the area itself, uh, in which Pactel already uh, already operated, and so um, and so Pactel won that auction by simply uh, saying that they are for sure going to want to win, and so they took a very aggressive stance. And the other bidders were like, you know what, I'm not going to participate in this, and so they became much more conservative. So. Um, this is an almost common values model where we have almost common understanding of what it's worth. However, some players or one player has a disproportionate uh, understanding of what it's worth. It's worth more to them, and everybody knows that, right? So uh, that means th the model shows that the bidder with a higher value will bid very aggressively, and that the competing bidders uh, with a lower value will bid more conservatively. And so this gives an advantage to the one who is bidding aggressively. So if you uh, if you know something about something and bid aggressively, it is basically saying that others will be like spending, will be taking a step back. So if you want to win something and pay less for it, you should be actually bidding extremely aggressively on a lot. And it's a common technique uh, that's known that. So there are advantage. You don't have to be aggressive by knowing something that others don't know. You just need to appear aggressive in an auction, which means you like increase a lot and try to to bid a lot or anything like that. Uh, so that's one technique that uh, that works, and the model shows uh, how how that works. So, uh, so in um, in the computer science uh, uh, theories, uh, people try to uh, generalize, uh, try to approach this as a more generalized analysis. So instead of having this like tree of features and trying to create different models, try to say, well, let's can we model the entire auction space as one type of thing? And um, the solution was to create these, something called a mechanism. And a mechanism uh, was created new terminology in auctions, and these are agents. So think of like different actors with different roles to play. Usually an agent has a type, and then the agent uh, acts uh, as what his, that, that type dictates. Uh, there are some outcomes, you know, who is going to win, and so on. A bunch of decision rules, transfers of information, no money, and then social choice function. I'll skip this. This is pretty thick, uh, but quite interested if you want to uh, read through it. Now, more interesting are uh, the consequences of, uh, of all these models of auctions and what they're susceptible to uh, in terms of cheating. Now, I think this is much, much more interesting for this crowd. So, um, Different auction types are susceptible to very uh, different types of uh, manipulation. So let's take the, uh, the, for the very simple one. Uh, let's imagine we have a ring of bidders. And that ring, uh, also known as a pie or uh, kippers, uh, will just agree up front that uh, we are going to, uh, to get a lot, and then we're going to re-auction it just amongst ourselves. Uh, so this uh, has, uh, potentially we can even resell the lot after we bought it and just divide the proceeds around us, right? So if we know the price of something and we can all not bid too high, get the lot, sell it for much more to somebody who was already in the room uh, and uh, who, who maybe or who was not in the room and then we can divide the proceeds as well. Um, there, are, um, uh, there are bidding clubs that, uh, invite uh, bidders to join and bid before the auction. So this is to minimize the actual price paid for a lot at the auction. We can all just run the auction beforehand and see how far we can go and only let the winner 
go to the actual auction where the lot will be sold and therefore minimize the price. Now, of course, we're going to pay to participate in such a, it's called a knockout auction. We're going to participate uh, in that uh, beforehand. We're going to pay fees to do that, but it minimizes the price that the winner is going to pay at the end. And of course, it assumes that, the, um, that there's nobody else in the room who is going to be bidding more than us, who we might all uh, lose. And so in an English auction, um, there is no way that a single ring member can, uh, can exploit the uh, can exploit uh, the situation because everything is visible. And if I see somebody suddenly bid while they were not supposed to, I'm going to bid too. Right? But in a silent auction, a single ring member that drops out and quietly goes and, uh, and bids on something, uh, they can also break the ring. So there's also this like thief stealing from a thief uh, issue uh, as well. Um, sniping... Uh, is, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, there's no advantage in a timed auction that ends at a certain time to bid early. In fact, all you're doing is signaling something. And maybe you want to be very aggressive and that's worth signaling, but other than that, there's no advantage. So people try to fit uh, and bid really fast at the very last minute, assuming that there will be fewer bidders that actually make the time so the price is lower. Now, that's risky. You might not get the lot, but you're trying to be the last person bidding at the like, microsecond at the very end. Now, many auction systems have created uh, solutions for that. Auctions get automatically extended and so on uh, and so forth. Um, bid shielding means that uh, if, if I have... Uh, I, there's nothing that prevents me from bidding multiple times. That was a very common problem on eBay, uh, where I can go and just bid for, against on, on, on my own lot. And so at the worst case scenario, I'm going to pay a lot of money for my own lot to myself. And maybe I'll just go and like auction it later at a lower price or, or something like that. And that's one way to not sell it at a certain low price and signal that the price is really high. Um, and uh, that's, that's extremely common. There is nothing that uh, prevents you from, uh, from doing, uh, doing that. And finally, the retaliation is because you got that spectrum of uh, the wireless signal, I'm just going to bid on the spectrum that you wanted. And uh, I don't care how much money I'm going to pay it. I just don't want you to be happy. And uh, I want to get the, uh, that, that other wireless spectrum because you didn't let me get mine. And then it goes out of control. So these are common techniques analyzed uh, throughout the paper. Uh, the more interesting uh, one of, of the kind of fraud is actually the auctioneer seller fraud. And, and wonderfully, a lot of auctioneer or seller fraud is completely legal. Uh, so I know that doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you think about it, the, the auctioneer has a, a bunch of information. Number one, they know the reserve price. Nothing prevents the auctioneer from saying that there is a bid at a lower price under reserve. And in fact, it is totally legal. And so uh, there's auctioneers out there that start bidding. They go, 10,000, 12,000, I have a 14,000 absentee bid. Nobody in the room, pass. That means that the lot was passed and uh, we didn't reach reserve price. Now, none of those bids existed, and uh, it's totally fine. Uh, there is fixing commissions, which is a very famous case for which Sotheby's and Christie's got in trouble uh, uh, in 2001. Uh, they started uh, aggressively bidding on lowering commissions in the late 90s. And so think of it, the, the commission for a art lot is 20% buyer, 20% seller traditionally. There's 40% on the amount that is being taken on top of whatever the the bidder is, is paying. You paying 20% for the privilege of buying a lot, the seller pays 20% for the privilege of selling the lot. So it's a lot of money. And so these two decided that they will just not go below a certain amount on commissions. And now, you know, you have only two major auction houses that are in control of, this, of the entire market, and the commissions are fixed. And uh, they, uh, they uh, decided that it would be the best uh, way to split profits, and that led to indictments by a federal jury in the United States. That's not, that's not uh, legal. Uh, so, <laughs> shells or puffers is this the the idea of that you uh, that you can bid on your own uh, on your own items, uh, and book bids is what I've described are the bids that the auctioneer places uh, as as absentee bids by somebody else. They don't actually have to have uh, a human there.
Uh, so there's a, quite a bit of research on uh, how to cheat at the auctions and uh, quite a bit of theory that shows you that uh, you're trying to cheat the system that cannot sometimes be cheated uh, and that, or you're getting the opposite effect of that, jail notwithstanding, of course. Uh, so the, uh, there, is, there, are, there are a few abstract models for auctions that are trying to theorize on how to do this and one is to consider that auctions have common characteristics and that uh, the, the variations are really some parameters. And so it's called a parametric model. It was uh, pioneered by University of uh, Michigan and there's an implementation called auction bot that's like a very, very generic uh, way of, uh, of implementing a wide variety of auction mechanisms. And in the beginning when I started working on this, I was like, I don't kind of don't want to write uh, a specific English auction as a, as a raw implementation, let me look at these very generic systems that are out there. It's really hard to understand what's going on. Now, they can implement English auction, but uh, it is very hard to comprehend what the heck is moving from which side and how this is configured to generate an actual English auction. So there are very few very generic systems. There is uh, um, another model that's based on, uh, on process. It's called the abstract process model and tries to... Um, to define all the actions that are possible in there, and you have things like bid calls, ask calls, collections, uh, and so on, and it tries to resolve all this in a generic way, tie breaking, uh, and, and others. So there's like nice diagrams if you're interested in looking at that. Um, finally, I want to uh, call some attention to uh, to two blog posts that we wrote on uh, on auction implementation. So um, I got a little a little scared from the whole uh, theory of what we can do with a generic auction and uh, tried to simply implement a single threaded, uh, very straightforward English auction in Ruby. And that actually worked quite well. Uh, we just ran a background queue that would look at all new bids coming in and would run them and create, you know, this is now the highest bid and it had implementation for features like reserves and everything else. And it was like 200 lines of code, and uh, there, were, there, was no, there were no transactions, uh, so because it's a single threaded operation, uh, and the, all the lots that are, all the bids that are being placed are just new entries in some database that say, you know, there's a new bid, and then you just run the bid, you, you run the position or the bid, you create an actual object that represents that, that, that you know, that's now the highest bid, and so on and so forth. So you can actually implement uh, a, basic, uh, a basic silent auction uh, in a straightforward way. There is some code and some description of how to do that. And then more recently, uh, we've implemented a real-time system. Uh, this one is written in Scala using event sourcing, so it's ACA-based. And um, there's a video of uh, the auctions team lead, Alan uh, Johnson, who talks about the implementation details of that, of that system. Uh, that's a little bit more complicated because there's a lot of real-time requirements. So uh, we, we have an agent sitting in the room with an iPad that, uh, uh, that looks at the iPad, which uh, represents uh, the same auction running online. And so you can go bid online. And when they see when the auctioneer says 10,000 and looks at the room, they look at the iPad that says there's a bidder for 10,000, press a button and raise their hand, and then they are given the lot at 10,000, and then they go and record that the uh, lot has been now belongs to one of our bidders for 10,000. There's somebody else who is writing every number as it goes on. So it's automated to the room, but it's not actually automated in the room. Uh, and uh, they, there's multiple agents like that. There are some people with phones that are basically doing the same thing. So it's like phone bidding uh, with supported by the internet so we don't have to have one-to-one -one relationships but one-to-many. Many people can bid on the same thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredibly low uh, throughput because there are very few things uh, going on uh, and it's like one of these very, very low volume type transactions. So while many people can think of auction as something that is needs to be extremely fast and really efficient, really what needs to be fast is some of the information flow. But there's very little to do and very little data to transfer an auction like that. Now, uh, that's not to say that the stock market is like that at all because you have all this information coming in at a high pace and time may matter because the, the, the clearing is happening continuously. So high frequency trading and things like that are completely, completely different, but use the same uh, theory though. So there are some interesting questions that are asked uh, in this paper um, that to, for you to all think about. 
One is whether, given all this auction theory, can automated trading in an auction outperform humans, or is this just you know you you are you can be replaced with a machine, or can the machine do better than you because it has more information or can process things faster? And then uh, there's something called uh, MOP, market-oriented programming, and it looks at this problem kind of backwards, and it says, can a market-based method compute the outcome of a distributed problem. If you think of an auction, in a way, it's a distributed problem where everybody has their own uh, opinions and it's doing their own parts. And so maybe uh, there is a way to use the, te the techniques that are implementing auctions to solve some other interesting problems. Uh, so here's some, some references. Uh, this is from the paper. You can find it online and so on and so forth. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think we definitely have some time for some questions, if anyone has any. Uh, we got one up front. I have some mics coming forward. There's one up front right here. You got a couple right here. Oh, I'm going to hand you mine first to get this going. So how do you model the IPO market and the day-to-day -day stock market if you want to model it to what you just described? Well, I've never implemented either an IPO or a stock market. Uh, so. So I'm not sure, but I think it's it's like a clearinghouse uh, problem, right? So you you need to resolve asks and bids and continuously run them to see what's how they agree. Uh, but auctions are IPOs are an auction, though, correct? Yes. I believe so. Yes. I don't think I can answer that question. Well, it, I think IPOs are generally very similar to it, just the opening day of a stock market. It's you know you say okay, what's it, who's wants to pay today? You know you know a quick a quick opening auction with an endpoint, and then it's like all right, continuous con continuous clearing from here on. Uh, is how IPOs generally work. I think it's just about setting the first price, right? Once exactly. you have the first price, everything else is uh, the same. Uh, from from what I understand, the opening price is set via call market. And uh, and I'm I'm not qualified to say exactly how that works. Maybe somebody can explain it better than me here. Don't ask me. I, that was literally the limit of what I know about auctions and IPOs, right there. No, no oh, I know. <laughs> oh, but nope. Uh, why did you guys pick uh, the English style auction to implement uh, oh. rather than say something uh, something else? Yeah, very very simply because that's the one that they were already running. Oh, no. So uh, the, uh, the it was just done on on paper. Okay, this is now is this what you, so this is what you actually use day to day on your. Yep. So, okay. so most uh, most auctions in the art market are English auctions. Okay. okay. Uh, so given that in, in the paper they mentioned that uh, the English auctions and the second price seal bid auctions are equivalent, if you have the, um, the independent values model, if you use that, and given that you mentioned that. These uh, your the volume is pretty low in terms of number of bids submitted. And one that these are auctions that you deal with. It m would maybe another style of auction do better? Because as you said, the, seal, the second price sealed bid auction often has this problem of underpayment, or it's not optimal for the seller for yeah. the house. Have you guys looked at that at all? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we 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 have uh, we've approached different people to tell them that there may be other types of auctions uh, to run. Uh, for uh, I think for the traditional traditional auction is more like theater, and so changing that requires many more different uh, activities, or uh, it's a, it will be a whole different production. And then similarly for silent nonprofit auctions, it's more like a dinner party than an auction necessarily. So and it's also one where bidders are actually there to give money. And so if you think about bidders who give money, the their goal is to give the most amount of money. So they're going to give everything they have. Their, their point is not to save money. And so that completely upsets uh, the part of the theory where I think there is a value to the object. Really, what I'm trying to do in a nonprofit auction is give away a certain amount of money. And I'm just trying to find excuses and reasons to attach the money, just not to write a check and pass it on, because that's too boring. That sounds that's actually really, really interesting, very insightful. And one other point I think to make here is that Artsy is not running these auctions themselves generally. They're, they're either implementing for somebody else or 
a member in another auction that's sort of doing the, the throughput, right? Well, so for, for nonprofit auctions, we run the auction digitally, right. but we are just a service. So we, we take some minor commission from the uh, per lot or something like that. And obviously for nonprofits, it's a lot less and stuff like that. But uh, like the we, one with, the, uh, with the iPad, for example, like that's, yeah. you're in an auction at Sotheby's right. so being a, a bidder. Exactly. So in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in an auction at uh, Sotheby's, Christie's, and others, we have a person in the room raising their hand on behalf of our bidders. So we're just another channel. Uh, for bidding in such an auction. And there, of course, the bidder has the same interest as any bidder would, which is pay less, get the highest price lot. You know. But at, at $110 million, the <laughs> we're, we're not talking like a big difference anymore. <laughs> any other questions from the room? So in your case, when you're saying you have a basically independent bidder in the room providing, uh, raising their hand on behalf of whoever your clients are, does that actually provide them an advantage because they you know, negate revenge and a few of the other uh, issues you're showing up with um, because you can't really tell who's behind the curtain that is the person with the iPad? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's definitely, anonymity is really important, but anonymity is not something we introduced. Uh, phone bidding has been around forever. You can, if you are a qualified enough bidder, you can get the person on the phone at the auction house. It just doesn't scale if you're a smaller bidder. Uh, if, you are, if you're only bidding on a couple of lots, it might be hard for you to get somebody at Christie's to pick up the phone. Uh, but you can go and bid on, uh, on our site, and uh, just like everybody else. Um, what did, I think it... Uh, it's interesting, the higher priced auctions, like evening sales where the prices are bigger, people are really looking at each other. They're definitely looking at who is bidding. And so uh, there are dealers, collectors sitting in front so that they don't want to see what's happening behind them, not to get influenced. Or they, are, they want to see it in front so that everybody can see what they're doing. And uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of knowledge that goes into bidding. So a dealer that owns you know, 100 Andy Warhols will make sure that no Andy Warhol gets sold for under a certain price because that would tank the market. So there's a lot of that going on in, uh, in there. But in the end, uh, the high price auctions are very few bidders and they kind of know about each other. Um, it's a very small, at the very top of the pyramid, it's a very small world. Uh, I think in the future, uh, the internet will even out that quite significantly. More questions? Yeah. Go on over there. Darren's going to bring you a mic. Hi. Uh, you said the English and Dutch are equivalent. How would you prove that? Like, <laughs> it it sounds equivalent, but I'm not really convinced. How would so, you prove that? So, uh, in an English auction, prices go up. In a Dutch auction, prices go down. But ultimately, the price being paid by the bidder is the close to what the bidder estimates. Uh, that price is to them, right? So if I have the same winner, well, the estimate is the price I'm paying because I was either the highest bidder or the highest bidder coming from the other direction. That's the only distinction between the two. Uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking from the behavioral aspects. I see, uh, like, in English, I can see what the other person is doing, but not in a Dutch way. Like, it's like a, the behavioral aspect, the panic right. aspect. So right. I'm, I'm asking for, like, statistical data. Like, if I auction the same thing 100 times in different places, like 50 times English, 50 times Dutch, like, unless I see that, I'm not convinced. I like not saying that I don't believe you, but. <laughs> that, that's, that's uh, it's fair. I can see why, uh, the, the, what I've yeah. described when the fact that other people are bidding on an item kind of matters to grow the price. So, in an English auction, you could maximize uh, the price, but uh, from the theory perspective, uh, the, the, model, the first model that calls them equivalent assumes that the value is not moving. And uh, if you look at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the third model, I think, that I uh, talked about, the one where the prices are correlated, then they are not equivalent anymore. So it's not, I'm not trying to say that English and Dutch auctions are the same thing. They are, uh, in different models, they behave differently. It's a, st it's a style of auction and a type of auction. But depending on what, how you think about the world, the, those two auctions will produce different results. So if that answers your question. The equivalent only in the, uh, I forget which, the first, the first model of, uh, of that. 
the, the, the outcomes would be the same if the, if the assumptions of that model are true, which is that the, uh, the bidding, that the value of the item is known to everyone and does not change over the time. That I, I, I have a number in my head and I don't care what else is going on. This is based on economics, the perfectly rational actor. Yes. This is not reality. <laughs> But so so it's also it's also possible. So in in uh, there there is definitely attempts in uh, to produce the ideal auction. So if we release all information and we know everything about everyone, such as what everyone is willing to pay for it, in the end we should know who wins, right? The person who assigns the highest value to the item, and uh, we ignore psychology. The problem is always psychology is that if I know that somebody values this item for more money, then maybe I will reconsider my own valuation. That changes everything. I know I saw at least one more hand before that question. And just to add one more thing to that. One purpose of an auction is to determine what the right value for the item is. That creates the market for the item. So it's one way to figure out what you think that is worth. The basket that sold for $110 million effectively has created a much larger basket market. The prices are higher than they used to be. And, uh, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a setting act as well. And this is what makes all these uh, me mechanisms difficult because they're recursive and they feed into each other as well. It seems to me that you've skipped two things. One is defining, defining auctions into fungible and non-fungible. The T-bill auction, the stock auctions, the Dutch flower auction, the fish market auction, for the most part are fungible goods. The uh, uh, auction for Monet, a particular Monet, is characteristically different from every other auction for a Monet. There's no fungibility there. And that makes a big difference. The second thing is in the, there are two other things related to that. One is you didn't cover in the categorization scheme how the T-bill auction works, where you get people bidding and they take the top end bids till they fill the hopper. It doesn't quite match the characterizations you put up there. That's a Dutch auction. It's a, well, it's a sort of a Dutch auction. It's not, a Dutch auction is a single lot, winner takes all. A table auction is I have $10 billion and no bid is more than say a billion. The top 10 billion of bids win. No, I, I will, uh, there, I, I did, um, go uh, over this paper, and so the paper may be missing some uh, characterizations of auctions. Uh, I think there are a few things I did choose not to include because they would just dilute things and that are a little bit complicated, like auctions that run in multiple rounds, for example, is another one that I think is, uh, is, an, interesting, is an interesting thing. And it's de described in quite, quite depth. Uh, the one that you have described is not in the paper, and I'm sure Simon would love to hear. Uh, the, the, the last it. item is an observation about this New York Stock Exchange. I don't know about the London Stock Exchange, but the presence of a specialist is more active than the description given. Namely, a specialist has an obligation with their capital to buy certain minimum or sell certain minimum amounts. Mm -hmm. It creates a major stability change versus a non-capital committed market like NASDAQ. I, that, that it's, it's definitely, uh, I think that's a very interesting observation. When I was reading the paper, there's quite a bit on, on that, actually. You're right. Thank you. And on that note, I think we're going to go ahead and call it. Thank you very much for coming out tonight, folks.